Welcome back. It is still uh, the run-up, uh, and we are looking at a statement made by the governor of River State, Nyesom Wiki. He said, peace and security will continue to elude Nigeria if people who think they are majority, they are more in number, continue to rub it off on you know the minority and that statement has continued to generate a lot of back and forth schools of thought have come up to say a lot of things but to have that conversation with us this morning is uh mr lekon ishola good morning sir you're welcome yeah thank you very much good morning all right so you're familiar with the statement the governor made yesterday how do you react to such a statement yeah, I read the statement. I, I read it in the news, and then just like any politician would, you know, try to latch on on popular sentiments. I believe that's what Governor Oke you know, was trying to do. Um, from the story, he was talking about political marginalization, you know, and then um, if you understand um, the context of his um, opinion, he he will was actually talking about what's happening in his party, the PDP, you know, and the, the, the fact that the PDP jettisoned the zoning arrangement and gave their ticket to somebody from the north and all that. And then um, it's been like, okay, the north is trying to marginalize everybody. And that's what the government Ricky was saying. Uh, for me, that's a political statement, actually. Uh, you expect any politician who has lost, you know, an opportunity to you know, get uh, power to say things like that. But be that as it may, we, we need to examine that statement deeply. Politicians just throw words and then facts, numbers, which they create on their own and all that. But yes, there is marginalization in Nigeria, no doubt about that. But there are at least two levels of marginalization. The first one is, you know, the political marginalization. And then the second one, of course, is the um, economic marginalization. The political marginalization, if I were to take it from the angle of um, Governor Wike, I would say with all respect to him that he was wrong. Um, the problem we have in Nigeria was largely, the problem of political marginalization was largely solved by um, the late General Sonia Apacha, who in 1995 you know, um, decided to say Nigeria should recognize six political regions. And that's what we brought into this current political dispensation, six political regions. And um, ideally, each political region is supposed to have an opportunity to be at the helm of a fear you know, of, the state, of the country. So in that case, if you look at uh, what we have had from 1999 to date, you can easily tell yourself that um, it's only one political region so far that has not had opportunity, you know, to be um, in the political leadership of the country. You all know that political. If you do your array, if you do your calculations and you do your studies of who and who has been ruling, in, you know, from 1999 to date, you will know that political region that has not been represented. The question then is: Is it the marginalization of that specific political region that has fueled insecurity in the country? That's the first question you should ask. And the answer will be no, because again, the, the word insecurity has dimensions. You know, there is, of course, when you talk of political, you know, um, marginalization leading to insecurity, for example, you should be talking about insurrection, you should be talking about self determination you know, agitation and things like that. Is that the insecurity that is threatening to kill Nigeria today? The answer is that is not it. The one that is threatening to kill this country actually has its root in economic marginalization. And that is the fact that you have crime, you have banditry, you have kidnappings, you have ritual killings. You have different activities that will not make people go about their legitimate you know, businesses in a tensionless situation. That is not because of political marginalization. And see, polit the politicians, they are just less than 5% of our country. They are, they are interested in capturing power. And any politician that, you know, finds itself out of the net in these arrangements is always crying foul. The same thing with um, Governor Wiki.
Governor Wike is not from that um, region, political region, that should be talking of marginalization. So for me, I think it's a political statement that he has made. But the fact is, yes, we have marginalization. And what is fueling our insecurity is not the kind of political marginalization that Governor Wike was you know, talking about in his statement. It is actually economic marginalization of a large segment of this country. Uh, but sir, you you uh, just sir, you, you just mentioned you, two types of marginalization, political and economic, and it was a blanket statement that there was uh, unchecked marginalization leading to insecurity in our country. If you are pitching your tent with the other part of marginalization, economic marginalization, which doesn't have a region, then there must be some uh, credibility to the statement that he made. What can we do to make sure this marginalization, this economic marginalization uh, is checked? Because he used the word unchecked. So if we can check it, that means there may not be as much crime as there is today, which we have confirmed also this economic marginalization is causing. So what can we do? Well, I don't know. It, sometimes any statement yeah. that is made by even you and I, if, you, if I make a statement that is against a particular a political party, whether my statement is true or not, I will be branded another, the opposition <laughs> political party. Yes. So if I'm making a statement against the PDP, for instance, they will say I'm APC or Labour. And if I'm making a mm. statement against uh, the other party, they will say I'm you know, the opposition. Why, why do we always have to look at every statement made as a political statement? And, and I, I think uh, Governor Wiki was taking a swipe at some other perspectives and aspects when he made that statement. Because if you... Uh, narrow it down and call it only a political statement mm. and then when you read through the story of you know what he said he said people who think they have more numbers mm. they have more power rubbing it off on the minorities it cannot just be a political statement uh, and then he, if you read further you see where he I, I guess where Liko got that idea from because Wiki mentioned that he wasn't very happy, and of course, he has always made it known about the choice of the presidential candidate of his party coming from the north, and the back and forth that has happened with you know southern governors expressing okay. their you know the, how disheartened they are about that and all that. Okay, well, Lincoln is still back. Um, let's let's see. Um, sorry, we we lost the call uh, earlier on, but uh, we're glad that you're back here. You. We were trying to make a point. I was asking you what we can do to make sure this, at least the economic uh, marginalization, which you have attested to, that has all, could also fuel insecurity. What can we do to make sure that one is checked? Uh, uh, thank you. Hello. Fact is, okay, yeah. we, we have, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. The, yeah, the fact is, we, we have a basket of problems on the table, right? The biggest of them today, which affects the largest segment of this country, as I've said earlier, is the you know, economic marginalization. Just like you have asked, how do we go about solving it? The first, the first thing we need to do is is for us to have a sincere government. You see, we, we need to, the government needs to ask itself, why do we have crime? Why do we have banditry? Why do we have kidnappings, ritual killings? You know, mm. what, what's been termed here? And a lot of things that make people have sleepless nights. It is simply and largely, you know, because there is poverty, there is frustration, there is inability by people to have joy in their country. Just, and how does Mr. that Mr. Come Shola, about? Just, just a moment, Mr. Shola. Um, you raised okay. a point that we need to have a sincere leadership. That is where we can start to yeah. correct what we need to correct. And if we're trying yeah. to decipher between uh, the, the economic marginalization and political marginalization and set that dichotomy and remove political. How can we have sincere leaders 
when we have a political marginalization, which you said may not even be directly responsible for insecurity. Because a lot of people have argued that we have the kind of leadership we have now because of political marginalization, where a group of people, because they have the numbers or they are set to have the numbers, dictate who becomes who in our country. So I'm seeing a relationship here. I don't know if you see that relationship as well. Yeah, yeah, you see, thank you. As I said earlier, we have a basket of problems. When you are looking at the problems, there will be definitely areas where they look alike, areas where, you know, they, they interchange, areas where you also have some kind of, you know, um, different levels of relationship, no doubt about that. But you have to separate them. Um, when we talk about leadership, the process of getting the leadership is what political marginalization will solve. I mean, it's what you will solve when you attack the issue of political marginalization. It is the process of getting the leadership. Now, the performance of that leadership is another thing. Is another thing. And as I have said, there is a template for solving the political marginalization, which has been created since 1995 and which we started implementing up to this point, and that is the fact that power has to rotate. And I said, even coming from Governor Wiki and knowing the antecedent of what led him to say that, the fact is he himself is not sincere about solving that particular political marginalization problem because he doesn't even come from that area that should be shouting. But be that as it may, when you have the, prob the leadership properly, you know, put in place through a process that addresses the marginalization concern. The, the next thing is what is the texture? What is the focus of that leadership? Look, you can have a leadership that solves the problem of political marginalization, of being somebody from any tribe that is shouting and put the person there. The question is, who is that person? What is the vision and mission of that person? in relation to the larger concern of the economic marginalization that is affecting people. Without solving economic marginalization, you solve political marginalization. OK, I, I don't think he has made his point. What I have said is the texture, the texture, the personality, the profile, the mission and vision of the leadership is key to solving economic marginalization. Okay. All right. Uh, Jez, we've been able to establish a, you know, a connection or relationship between the economic marginalization and uh, political right. marginalization. But do you see uh, a, 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 us getting to a point where we're able to scream Uhuru and say, okay, we've come to the point where we now have a balance between the economic aspect of things and the political aspect of things and everybody is happy. I mean, I'm asking this question based on uh, what we've seen in the past, the current situation of things politically in the country and how 2023 is looking to everybody, do you think there, was, there is ever going to be a point where we are going to get it right and make sure that everybody is satisfied? Yeah, you see, I am an optimist. I see it and I pray it works. But let me tell you the route that we have to take. Going to 2023, you need to ask yourself, where do the majority of the strength of this country, the future strength of this country, where does it lie? It lies in the youth. The next question you ask yourself is, where is the preponderance of the youth population of this country aligned to in terms of their political, I don't want to use the word choice, let me say political dream? out of all these candidates we have, you need to see it, it's clear. The question then, the, the, the answer then is, if Nigeria is interested in a few. Oh dear. Best of our strength as a country, Nigeria, as we go towards 2023, should allow the voice of the youth, you know, to count. 
We should have a leadership that is youth centric, not all these you know pretenses that we have from majority of the candidates. There is, there is, you don't need to even um, have a crystal ball to see. There is a mass movement of youth in support of a particular candidate. And if Nigeria is interested in our future, and we want to speedily solve the problems, then 2023 should be an opportunity for us to give the youth a kind of president that speaks their language, that meets their aspiration, and that offers them real hope. Because you see, once you have the large segment of your country displeased, you have the large segment of your country you know, frustrated, you have the large segment of your country's population, you know, saying, look, we are not happy, we want this, and you refuse to give it to them, you are only postponing the evil day, you are not solving the problem. But if we as a country are interested in solving our problems, I, I can tell you one thing. Look, I can tell you the scenario that I, I believe will play out. If, for instance, the youths, the, the, the president we have in 2023 is a president that the youths really want. And don't forget, the youth represents over 60% of, of our country's population. Now, factor in the fact that by 2027, for instance, the average 17, 18-year-old Nigerian would be 21, 22 in 2027. And he is already, or she is already, seeing a picture of hopelessness. And you don't give them, or you don't give people like that, opportunity for hope, opportunity for, you know, excitement, opportunity to embrace their country. You can see that by 2027, what we are even witnessing now is a child's play in terms of this um, effect of economic you know, marginalization. The youths are angry, not because uh, the president is not from their part of the country or whatever. That one is for politicians. The youths largely are angry because there are no opportunities for sincere, legitimate expression of their talents, of their dreams. That's, that's what is telling it on their own part. You understand? And then secondly, there is poverty, mass poverty, mass poverty fueling all these things. Now, how do you get out of this mess? The first thing is to give the country to the youth and tell them, hey, this is the country. What that does immediately is that it makes everybody to embrace the country. It makes everybody to love the country and to want the country to survive. And once you have that, once once that comes, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Just wrap up, please. Okay, yeah. So once you have that, you realize that the issues are half solved and the other ones you can solve along the line. You don't solve the problem of the country in one, two, three, four years. You solve part of it, but it's important to start from the most important mm -hmm. aspects of it. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ishola, for your thoughts on the issue uh, of uh, this marginalization as brought to us by uh, Governor of River State, Nyesom Wike. We thank you so much for being a part of our program today. Thank you very much, Lord Steve Africa. I'm grateful. Thank you. Yeah, he, he made this point. Um, one, one takeaway from what he was saying is that give the people their choice i'm i would not subscribe to okay just carry it and hand it over to the mm -hmm. youths if they don't go out to vote but if the nigerian people vote and they see that their votes counted no matter who wins they will see that it was the choice of the majority and much as i want to agree with what you just said i'm sorry uh, young persons have I think abundantly made it clear that they are very interested, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the process. forthcoming 2023 general election and in the political process entirely. It's not just about the 2023 elections and they sit back. I mean, they've given a timeline of consistency. If I'm if I'm not exaggerating, uh, let's leave whatever happened behind 2020 behind 2020 but from 2020 down the young persons in nigeria who uh statistics has shown are you know uh consist the majority of the population of mm -hmm. the country and they've been consistent with their cry with their statements with their ideas with their 
you know, um, perspectives. And they've continued to show it. it the INEC, INEC uh, uh, statement that came out recently says that the number of registered voters for 2023 general election has largely doubled and the more percentage of these people are yes. young women and men the youths so i don't think we are at the point where we are trying to get the youth to agree to participate mm. no they are at the forefront what they are saying is please leave the road we want to pass yeah well my, my point was just generally that um the fact that the youths are making the noise we know some of the political... Um, I do not agree with the, your just, choice just of words. How let do you land. say making... We are not let, making noise. Let me land. Let me land. <laughs> the youths are making a point. Yeah. Okay. Let me yes, not, I let agree me not with use that. noise if I use that. Uh, they are making a point. But from his statement, it should not be seen like, okay, because the youths are supporting candidate A, B, C, the election will just, the results of the elections will just be given to that candidate, APC, oh, or ABC, not sorry, not APC. Yes. So the youth is also a call to the youth that whatever you're doing now, maintain the tempo, mm -hmm. make sure you vote, mm -hmm. and let us see that the votes count. Mm -hmm. So that when that candidate you have anointed wins, we will start to see that, okay, we're, they're restoring confidence in the people and all that. So the work doesn't end here. It ends after February where the elections will come. So oh, maintain the momentum. It actually doesn't end after February because then At we least. have the work of holding whoever it is accountable. Accountable, yeah. Yes. So then it, it continues. It's, it's called, it's the run-up for our, a reason. It's our, it's our government. That's how it's going to be. Exactly. I'm not saying that as a youth. I'm not <laughs> a youth. It's, your, it's our government collectively because some people who are aged like I am will vote for some candidates. And yeah, at the I'm end who? of the day, it becomes uh, you, aged. It, it becomes that all of us. Yeah. Uh, Please yeah. raise your walking stick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll quickly take a break now, and when we return, we we'll come uh, back with our second guest, who will be talking to us about what happened in Murtala Mohammed International Airport and what is really happening in the aviation industry. We'll be joined by an aviation expert after this break. Stay with us. <laughs> 